Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening for the Matter of Black Lives panel, featuring Amanda Johnston, Sean Taylor, and Samson McCormick. My name is Katrina Bruton. I'm the African American Center Librarian here at the San Francisco Public Library, and I'm excited to be moderating tonight's discussion on the use of poetry, humor, comics, and literature to facilitate discussion on the current state of black America. I'd like to first begin the presentation by introducing our panelists. Amanda Johnston earned an MFA in creative writing from the University of Southern Maine. Her poetry and interviews have appeared in numerous online and print publications, including Poetry, Kinfolk's Quarterly, Muzzle, Pluck, and the anthologies Small Batch, Full, and The Ringing Ear, Black Poets Lean South. The recipient of multiple artist enrichment grants from the Kentucky Foundation for Women and the Christina Sergeyevna Award from the Austin International Poetry Festival, Johnston is a member of the Afrolation Poets and a Cave Canaan Graduate Fellow. Johnston is also a Stone Coast MFA faculty member, a co-founder of Black Poets Speak Out, and founding executive director of Torch Literary Arts. Sean Taylor has been a lecturer at San Francisco State University, where he has taught classes in hip hop and popular culture, media studies, transculturalism, and digital humanities. A lover of comic books, Taylor is one of the co-founders slash organizers of the Black Comics Arts Festival that annually takes place over the Dr. Martin Luther King holiday weekend. A writer with two published books, including People's Instinctive Travels and the Paths of Rhythm, and Big Black Penis, Misadventures in Race and Masculinity, his writings have appeared in the New York Times, Rad Dad, and the online edition of Ebony. You may find his writings on geek nerd culture at thenerdsofcolor.org, the nerds and he will also be launching a podcast media venture during the latter part of this year. Samson McCormick, our third panelist, is an award-winning stand-up comedian, writer, and social justice advocate. He has been touring the country, performing at venues that have included the legendary Howard Theater, the Comedy Store in LA, and the San Francisco Punchline and Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. One of the most celebrated LGBT comics today, McCormick exhibits a down-to-earth and lighthearted sense of humor, and effectively engages audiences on topics of religion, politics, race, and sexuality. So tonight's discussion will begin with our panelists each presenting a 10 to 15 minute presentation, followed by a brief Q&A for myself before opening the floor to questions from the audience. He shot him. He shot him. When he came, when he came back, back, he shot, shot and, he, and fell. he fell, stumbling, stumbling past, past the shadow wood, wood. Down, down, shot, shot. and the cool surprise and the fixture of his hands and fingers. We know nothing. We know nothing. We know nothing. Incident. Incident. My name is Amanda Johnston. I'm a black poet who will not remain silent while this nation murders black people. I have a right to be angry. That video you just saw was created by the poet and visual artist Rachel Eliza Griffiths for Black Poets Speak Out. Um, I'm going to start my presentation with a poem um, because those are the tools that we were able to bring forth as poets and they're continuing to share and push forward the message of uh, working against police violence in the United States and abroad. Facing us after Yusef Komunyaka. 
My black face fades, hiding inside black smoke. I knew they'd use it, damn it, tear gas. I'm grown, I'm fresh. Their clouded assumption eyes me like a runaway, guilty as night chasing morning. I run this way, the street lets me go. I turn that way, I'm inside the back of a police van again, depending on my attitude to be the difference. I run down the signs, half expecting to find my own name protesting in ink. I touch the name Freddie Gray. I see the beat cop's worn eyes. Names stretch across the people's banner, but when they walk away, the names disappear from their lips. Paparazzi flash cuts across a protester's stare. Call it riot. The ground. A body on the ground. A white cop's image hovers over us, then his blank gaze looks through mine. I'm a broken window. He's raised his right arm, a gun in his hand. In the black smoke, a drone tracking targets. No, a crow gasping for air. Thank you. Thank you. So Black Poets Speak Out um, was a campaign that started very, it was very personal. It started in 2014 in November, right when the non-indictment for Officer Darren Wilson came in the murder of Mike Brown. When that happened, I was sitting in my home in Austin, Texas. I was at the island in my kitchen, and I was completely devastated because there is no difference between Mike Brown and my daughters. There's no difference between Mike Brown's family in Ferguson and my family in Austin, Texas. And if I'm watching this boy, this 18-year-old who was graduating from high school, getting ready for college, lay in the street in his own blood for four hours in the United States of America after doing nothing, that could be my children, that could be me. So I wanted to do something. I don't like feeling helpless. I don't like feeling out of control. And maybe I am, but we can do something. I said there has to be something we can do. So as a Cave Conum Fellow, I turned to the largest organization that I'm a part of with all of the tools at my resources, which is poetry, which is literature, which is the community that I'm a part of. And I asked the fellows and faculty, what can we do? We started to have a conversation. My sister, Mahogany Brown, called me and said, I can feel you. I can feel you through these internet posts. I can feel you needing help. What can we do? And it, between Mahogany Brown, myself, Jericho Brown, Sharina Rodriguez, and John Terry Gadsden, we developed an idea to post videos online. We said we could do that for several reasons. One, first, it puts your face and your personhood into this work, that you are putting your, taking that risk to say, I, my name, Amanda Johnston, am not gonna sit here and allow this to happen without me responding against it, without me acting uh, quickly in unison with people across the country. So we said we would do these videos, and within a few days, there were over 100 videos internationally posted online and shared through social media. With those videos, you also hear that opening statement, the, my name and I am a black poet or ally say, I submit this video in support and solidarity with black poets speak out and I have a right to be angry. We unify all of the videos with that statement to show that it's not off puts, right? It's not outliers and, and one offs of people doing this work, but that we are a concentrated unified group of people who have said that we are tired of police violence in this country. We are tired of watching our loved ones slain in the street. So we did that and then organically it started to grow. Um, Black Poets Speak Out then had the videos, but we needed to be in community with each other. We needed to see each other, lay hands on each other, hold each other. So we started doing live events. Uh, December 6th was the first reading in Washington, D.C., the first live Black Poets Speak Out event. Since then, we've had well over 50. We've had panels, programs, readings, poetic protests have all happened across the country and in the UK, but we needed to do more. 
So we continued doing the work and we decided we wanted to do a letter writing campaign that directly tied the art and activism to civic engagement. So on 2015, January 1, I dedicated myself to write a letter every single day to elected officials from my home state of Texas all the way to the White House. In 2015, I sent well over 400 letters. Um, now I wanna be clear, that is work, but that is not marching, that is not the, the same as, as sitting as sit-in, that's an email. And that's something that everybody can do. That, that was that easy to send. You can send mass emails. So it was really easy for me to do, but what was really telling was to see the non-response. Um, I had emailed Ted Cruz as a senator from Texas. I emailed the White House. I emailed 150 state representatives, and I got back less than 10 replies. So being 2016, that's good information to have as a voter then going forward, right? And what, all, what does all of this have to do with poetry? Well, poetry has been around forever, and as James Baldwin said, it, it is of the people, right? That poetry is meant to disturb the peace, that artists are meant to disturb the peace. So when we're watching all of this unfold, um, it was quite natural as a poet to see the work that it needed to do in community. So letter writing campaign. And then fourth and, and finally, it has grown into lesson plans where we now offer online lesson plans for educators. How many people are educators? Or related to, okay, wonderful. Please come and see me afterwards. Um, we collaborated with Mosaic Magazine. Mosaic Magazine did a free um, lesson plan from Black Poets Speak Out that they published in their magazine, but you can also get it online. I brought a few issues with me. Please take them back to your campus. Um, so we wanted to make sure that education was a part of the Black Poets Speak Out campaign because we know that there are new generations that are coming forward, that there are young people who, who might not see everything that's happening, but they're hearing it, right? They're feeling it. It's, it's in their community. So we wanted to give them a way, an opportunity to be able to talk about what they see going on in their communities. Because let's be clear, young people, young people of color, young black people are the people who are suffering the most percentage-wise from this crisis, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we're addressing them and talking to them and letting them know they're not crazy, mm -hmm. that we see it, that we're here and that we are unified with them. Um, and this work is also intended to make sure that we don't forget, that we don't become numb, right? Um, when you start seeing hashtags and you start seeing the list and you start seeing the news and other media outlets look away and turn away, it's up to us to continue to say names like Mario Woods. It's up to us to continue to say names like David Joseph. Now, I'm from Texas, Austin, Texas. Have you heard of David Joseph? David Joseph was murdered February 8th. 2016 in Austin, Texas. He was 17 years old, he was naked, he was unarmed, he was shot within seconds of police arriving to a 911 call at 10.30 a.m. on a clear Monday morning. That child needed help. And what he got from Austin police were bullets. Have you heard of Sandra Bland? Sandra Bland was moving to Texas from Illinois. She knew her rights. She knew the law. She died in a jail cell she should have never been in. Have you heard the name Larry Jackson? Larry Jackson was murdered in 2013 in Austin, Texas. He attempted to use a bank. He went to a bank in the afternoon well after it had been robbed at 8 a.m. that morning, he came to the bank late in the afternoon. He had committed no crime, but he was chased down by an Austin police detective. That detective commandeered a vehicle to chase him, cornered him under the Shoal Creek Bridge, pistol whipped him, beat him so badly that his colon ruptured, and then the forensics showed he was shot execution style in the back of the neck. I say these details so that we don't forget. 
They want you to forget. I share these poems so that we don't forget. They want you to become numb. They want it to be business as usual. We have children. Children we are responsible for who we're trying to raise. We need them to know the truth. Black Poets Speak Out has videos from children as young as 10 years old, like Nicholas here, and our elders and seniors who are well over 80. I'm gonna let Nicholas speak to you. My name is Nicholas Howard I am a black poet who will not remain silent while this nation murders black people. I have a right to be angry. I am going to read a poem that I wrote called Protection. We all know, or at least we have known, the police have protected us, just not all of us. We all have to be treated equal. I believe in equality. Black or white, we have to be treated the same. It seems like the cops have flipped the aggressive switch on and they are pointing it towards black people. We're just asking the police to stop shooting these young black men. Please, stop this terrifying repetition of people of color getting murdered. It's horrible to even think about police shooting and killing young people of color. Police, you have to stop murdering and start protecting. It's your job. It's all of our job. It's all of our job to stay focused and attentive, to not look away, to not become numb, to be allies for each other, to show up and witness, and to remember that we have power. One of the greatest lies is to say that we are powerless. We are operating under a system of laws that we created, that we obey, that we trust. So what happens when we start to say that we matter more than the lie? April is National Poetry Month, and I'm gonna close with um, a, a small writing that I shared with uh, the Academy of American Poets that was published in this month, month's issue of Poetry Magazine. As we celebrate National Poetry Month, let us widen our gaze to see clearly the people and lives blurred in the margins of rhetoric. Let us ask ourselves how we are using our power and privilege in language to empower our communities, lift the voices of others, and speak for those who have been silenced. Over the past year, I have watched poets and allies rally in the word to speak out against police brutality through the Black Poets Speak Out campaign. I've seen poems raised at demonstrations in the name of justice. I've watched a man attend an open mic searching for the best words to share with his son when children were killed by those sworn to protect them. He was given James Baldwin, Audre Lorde, June Jordan, and more. The poets read him the words of Ross Gay, Evie Shockley, Denez Smith, and others. In this way, I have turned to my own writing, searching for the best words in darkness and light, I've asked myself, who and what are my poems in service to? Let our poems be in service to the people. Let each word work relentlessly to call forth the best of our humanity. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Um, it would probably make sense to kind of talk about um, my growing up. Um, I was one of those odd kids that everybody went into a room and were like, yeah, he's odd. And I um, never knew what it really was. I read my first book at three, Winnie the Pooh and the Honey Tree. And then I finished The Hobbit in kindergarten. 
And when, once I read that, it pretty much kind of changed the course of my life. And for two reasons. One, reading in words and language have become uh, an obsession for me, but also the idea of fantastic worlds became something pretty like significant. Um, my mom's from Jamaica, dad's from Puerto Rico, um, and so they had kind of like, you know, even though Puerto Rico is the United States, um, met my dad like seven times, grew up in a pretty abusive household. And so um, comic books and fantasy science fiction became like the ultimate escape. And people look at comic books as like childlike things, but if you think about how difficult it is to read a comic book, you're looking at a comic book, you're looking at panels on a page, picture here, picture there, so your mind is actually having to build a bridge between the panels. And then you're also looking at language spoken to characters, not to mention dialogue, internal dialogue, and stage direction or play settings. And so it's really a complex art form. And once I discovered comic books, I pretty much checked out of the world. I was like, okay, you know what? I don't wanna watch my mom getting beat anymore. You know, I don't wanna watch, I don't wanna get beat by my mom's boyfriends anymore. What am I gonna do? I would just get a stack of comic books and I would just be basically, I had a fort built in my closet and I would just sit there and read all day. I'd go to school, go to school, get through it, come home and read all day. And so this type of, this like this, the idea of the fantastic, um, when I hit around, I mean, before that it started with Star Wars in 1977, I saw it when it came out and everybody's like, oh my God, everybody's so juiced about Star Wars. And I was like, there was no black people in Star Wars. And I remember being on the playground and um, this kid, um, Matthew May, which is his real name, screw him, um, he basically was like, let's, you know how as a kid you want to play whatever TV show or movie's out? Well, let's play Star Wars, let's play whatever. And he's like, oh, Sean, you're a nigger. You could be Dark Vader or Chewbacca. Not Darth Vader, mind you, Dark Vader. And I remember like, okay. And I remember going back into Miss Mianovich's uh, classroom and getting, you know, those big yardsticks. And I came out with a little lightsaber and started smacking these kids with it. I was like, okay, I'll be the biggest, baddest, blackest force of evil in the entire galaxy. Yeah, absolutely I will. And I remember just like that, that rage as even, you know, this is kindergarten now. This is this rage I was feeling there. Then I realized that the stuff that I love didn't include me. Spider-Man comic books didn't include me. Superman didn't include me. Like nothing included what I looked like at all. And so then part of me was like, this is not okay. And now as a parent, these things still don't include my daughter. And this is the, we're in 2016. And you have like, you know, this like the diverse book movement that's been, you know, slowly gathering steam now. But I realized that, you know, this stuff, this, 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 the firmament of the fantastic is our stuff as well. Every single culture has a mythological tradition has a tradition of the fantastic, has a tradition of magic, whether it's shamanic magic, traditional magic, whatever, we have that, but we have been so excluded and being as a black person, I mean, there's probably very few cultures in the world that produce as much culture as we do, that has influence. I was telling Ms. Amanda here earlier today, I was at the southern part of the Philippines in Karkar on the island of Cebu, which is right before you get to Mindanao, and there's a burnt out church in the middle of a forest that had Snoop Dogg spray painted on it. And I'm like, we are in the middle of literally nowhere. I don't think I've ever been anywhere remote, remote in my life. And I'm like, wait a minute, we are everywhere, but, we're, but we aren't there. It's kind of like, if only our echoes existed, but the source of the echoes gets erased. Mm -hmm. We're just there all the time, whether it's, you know, corn rolls getting called boxer braids lately or People saying that, you know, some celebrity invented Bantu knots like Bjork and they've been going on for like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, um, like, uh, Paul Mooney's, you know, everybody wants to be one, but nobody wants to be one. And so, and I realized that in the stuff I love, like the science fiction, fantasy, speculative fiction, that we don't have enough of a presence. And uh, Mark Derry has this essay called Black to the Future. And he's the um, funny white journalist who kind of like coined the idea of Afrofuturism, which probably people are hearing a lot about right now. And the entire black existence is science fiction. I mean, white people came from a different planet with superior technology, landed someplace new, 
took people, abducted them, and landed them onto a different planet. I mean, the entire black story in the Americas is an alien abduction story. And there's something really kind of like mind blowing about that when you really start parsing it out. Like, you know, and then as Mando said earlier, but we've came from a sci-fi abduction story to superheroes because how are we even still alive? How is it that we've come from, I mean, whether we're watching the contemporary police brutality, I mean, Jim Crow, not that long ago, historical time, slavery, not that long ago. And if we look at it through a trauma lens, People expect it to be over and healthy right away. No, that's not really going to happen. So we're in this. So now we're in this time frame now where barriers to entry for cultural production are almost non-existent. Like my phone in my pocket is probably more powerful than the computers in the Viking space mission. I have a recording studio. I have a movie studio, and so now we can create culture and disseminate culture at a flick of a button. And so for me, it was how do I get more black kids, you know, or kids identify as black, whether they're biracial or whatever, to get involved in this geek stuff, because I think the geek stuff is very powerful. I mean, you look at the top 20 movies of all time, all but two are sci-fi or fantasy. All but two of all time. And something, but then you look at how many people are, um, people of color are actually in the first three leads, doesn't exist. How many women are in the first three leads? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't exist, and so that's problematic. And I love this stuff because I think because it's our modern mythology. Um, Grant Morrison, comic book author, is saying that like the comic book that we have now, the idols, they're basically basically cave paintings that we're touching up and making them new for newer generations to come from behind us. And for me, it's so important for representation because if you look at black representation in popular culture and media, it's 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 not three dimensional. It's tropes, you know, you know, Hillary Clinton and her super predator things that are coming back to haunt her now and the idea that we can't do anything more than just, you know, be violent or have violence done to us or that we produce other culture for people to consume, but we don't get any part of it. I'm like Buster Rhymes, uh, MC, hip hop MC said uh, hip hop, for example, is the only art form that makes money for people who don't even like it or the people who produce it. And so what I wanted to do was really kind of take back, maybe it's a little bit Marxist of me, but I wanted to kind of create production avenues for black people to get into this geek stuff because I think it's really powerful and important. And so I allied myself with a couple of people about, wow, 15, 16, 17 years now where I did a huge comic book drive. It was like, okay, because there's so many kids in the hood, you know, and there's that whole thing, whether it's true or not, that prisons are built by third grade literacy rates. And so we were like, we want all these books. And so we, we got, I think, 13,000 comic books donated to us. And we just gave them out into neighborhoods where we know that there, people were under-resourced. We just gave them out. And so we would have basically comic book clubs. Come out. People were looking at us, you know, big black guys, tattooed, whatever. Like, what is going on? These perverts coming in with comic books? Like, you know, but we came in and we were like, we were giving comic books out. And so we would actually go to libraries, church basements, and read comic books with kids and teach them in the literacy was incredible because they actually got to imagine themselves. We started with Spider-Man because Spider-Man, outside of his alter ego, Peter Parker, his face was covered. So anybody could be in that mask. There's that, there's that identity and identification that could be there. You know, because let's get real, because most comic books are just adolescent white boy power fantasies. You know, Batman, I'm rich, my parents died, let me kill somebody. You know, Iron Man, I'm rich. Let me beat somebody up. I mean, that's all it is. That's all these, there's a power fantasy. But when you start adding race, gender, sexuality, all the, all the cultural nuances to this geek culture, we get things like Octavia Butler. I mean, if you haven't read Kindred, you should just, after today, go buy it. And then buy 12 copies to share with people. <laughs> because it's probably one of the, the most transformative texts of my life. A black woman protagonist in an ostensibly science fiction novel was unbelievable. You know, people, we always get told that we don't exist in this space, but then you have Samuel Delaney, you had George Schuyler in the 20s, you have um, Tanner Reeve Dewey, who's Stephen Barnes' wife, you've got N.K. Jemison, you have Nalo Hopkinson, <laughs> Eddie Oracle for, you have all these people, Aizy Jama Everett, who's local, and we are there, we are creating these worlds because I think that we've been prescribed worlds for so long whether they're fantastic. I mean, like, how am I supposed to 
like connect with friends or Seinfeld or anything else because there's a white cultural default, which is fine to a degree. If it was, it was not, I'm not saying that you can't be a different color and appreciate somebody else's culture. I'm not saying, what I'm saying is that when I'm erased completely, when I'm omitted, and don't be Native American or Asian in America, you don't even exist in popular culture. And so there's nothing wrong with, you know, we want, we want that thing. We, you know, that's why I'm part of this group called The Nerds of Color. Our website's at thenerdsofcolor.org. And it's every possible color, sexuality, class, and we're all writing about this stuff because we're finding things a, we would critique, but B, we promote a lot of people doing this stuff. And for me, it's important because I think there's nothing more amazing than the activation of an imagination, especially for people who are oppressed. Because if you don't have the ability to dream yourself out of your situation, you're stuck. I mean, you have to be able to deform the idea that freedom, liberation is even possible, which is a supreme act of science fiction. And so being able to do that, I think we've done some good. I mean, like we were here in January, we, I'm a co-founder of the Black Comets Arts Festival. And it happens over Martin Luther King Day weekend, or this is our second year this year. And the kids are just like, you mean there's black superheroes that people are making? And like, you see their faces and just the, this world of possibility in their eyes. And I guess the highest form of praise I ever received was from my daughter, who's eight now, but at this time she was seven. She's like, Daddy. I was like, yeah. Because every time she's, you know how if you have kids, they have that octave where you're like, oh, dang. Like, you know, Daddy. I'm like, yes, baby. She's like, you're doing really good work. And I was like, why am I doing good work? She's like, well, because me and some other kids, you know, we get to be in space. We get to fly spaceships. We get to have powers because other people aren't thinking about that. And did I cry? Yeah. But it was a, such a powerful acknowledgement that, you know, this stuff matters to people. And I'm not just like some weird 43-year-old guy who still wants to play superhero. And so I'm like, if it, you want to give um, your kids reading, give them geek stuff. Give them comic books. Give them science fiction. Give them things. You'd be so surprised at how much literacy levels, like critical thinking levels, because what science fiction can do and geek culture can do, talk about problems like these problems in ways where people don't automatically just like shut off. Because we see so much tragedy every single day. Most of us have developed a really thick skin, social and psychological, psychic war, you know, skin. Whereas I can talk about race through Star Trek and talk about that. I can talk about the idea of taking back your community through vigilantism in comic books and really talking about these things. And so more than just it being a place for, for, um, for fantastic representation of oneself in these contexts, I think it's also a place where um, we can really get people to start being activated about things. So thank you. I'd like to now take this opportunity to discuss some of your views um, in terms of the relationship between expressive mediums such as poetry, humor, and comics, um, and activism. Um, so clearly activism can take on many forms uh, depending on one's own interests and strengths. Um, what advice would you, do you have for others wishing to use their particular talents and interests to, prom to promote discussion or affect change? Um, and anybody can just jump in, whoever is most comfortable. Um, show up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really number one. You all showed up tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for showing up. Um, every action starts with that first uh, movement of presence, right? Um, when Black Poets Speak Out, it happened because people wanted to show up. We wanted to do things and you know, not everyone has the same skill set. Not everyone has the same drive, you know, to be that person with the bullhorn at the front of the protest. Some people are, you know, like during the civil rights marches, there were plenty of people making plates and passing them out to the people who were passing as they were marching on their way to DC. So we need people at all points of those levels. But first you have to say, I can show up. You have to look at your hands and say, what can I bring? You know, you can bring poetry, you can bring, uh, fantasy, literary writing, you can bring comedy, you can bring so many different things, but first we need you to bring you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, oh, 
Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I would say not being afraid. Uh, for a long time, I was afraid because I lived in a closet. Uh, so when you live in a closet and people tell you, you know, and I'm from the South, so you know in the South, it's, oh, be mind those white folks. Um, so it was that and living in a closet. And I had to learn how to shatter both of those barriers in order to bring my full self and be able to be realistic about issues that affect folks. Some folks who will never be able to open their mouth and say, this is how I'm affected by this particular situation. And I don't do it to be an asshole, but I do it because it needs to be said. And I get emails sometimes from people saying, oh, Oh, like I was in Detroit uh, a couple months ago and it was mostly white audience and I talked about uh, race and some stuff I saw on Fox News and this guy sent me an email afterwards and he said oh I enjoyed the set but I'm glad that you kept the race stuff to a minimum like it makes people very uncomfortable but if it makes you uncomfortable stop doing it <laughs> 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 I think um, knowing the difference between being an activist and being activated, mm -hmm. um, I think we were talking about this earlier, I think that um, our artist people who want to make a difference burn themselves out too quickly mm -hmm. because all they do is like, you know, like, you want to come over and play chess? No, I got to go to the rally and I got to spring my words and show my art. I'm like, but you need to actually take care of yourself because if you're burnt out, you can't be of any use to anyone else. And you start resenting your talent. Yes. And then you start moving away from your talent because you use it only in the service of one thing as opposed to healing yourself with, with, with your gifts. And I think that there has to be a fine balance. And I think that if more people who do um, you know, this activist work became more activated and know when to turn it off and when to turn it on, I think we wouldn't lose so many people. I don't think we'd burn so many people out. Thank you. Um, and then <clears throat> this next question, I uh, just kind of wanted to know on a personal level, um, what have you learned, um, any of you, what have you learned in the time between beginning to share your medium in this, in this context and today? Yeah. W were there any surprises uh, along the way between, you know, through this journey of, of sharing um, your talents and using it for the greater good? I mean, I've realized um, how many people of color are invested in capital W whiteness. How many, because it's, there's, there's, there's like a very comforting thing to be a part of the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And once you decide to kind of go your own way, you know, people are like, no, 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 how, you know, and it's, it's as if it's wrong or as if it's an anomaly of some sort. And so, because we live in a world that's, that's white default and everybody is, you know, subscribes to that particular default. And so when you start doing something different, I mean, like, especially if you look at geek spaces, I mean, if you ever want to hate the world, read comments after an internet article about race and superheroes. Mm -hmm. You will hate the earth by the third post. <laughs> yes. And it's because it's always been the province of a particular demographic. And now we want to take things differently. I mean, like when, how many of you remember when John Boyega was slated to be in the new Star Wars mm -hmm. film? And you see just the sheer, everybody's like, oh my God, how dare you? You could believe that a big ass dog man could fly a spaceship, but you can't <laughs> believe that a black guy could be in a sci-fi context. There's a problem there that that's very terrifying. But then also a lot of the heat came from people of color who were invested in certain ideas that were given to them. And so when you are like the trailblazer or the herald of a new idea, you take a brunt of that. You are almost responsible for that shift in consciousness and shift in perception. And once you start changing the way you see and experience things, that's when a lot of the danger comes out. That's when a lot of the fear comes out. So people start grasping at straws and start punching at you because you've just disturbed their, 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 their baseline for X amount of years. And so that was what I've learned that People of color are really invested just as much as white folks are in a white supremacist construct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to add to that as far as things that were surprising. Also, uh, yes, the investment is, is totally there, but young people and how they are, are really, I'm sorry, they really give no fucks. <laughs> and, and the respectability politics are not there in, in the same way, you know, like, and that's refreshing. Like, that's what gives me hope. Um, in Austin, after Sandra Bland uh, died in uh, Waller County, there was uh, young people, college students, organizing a, a vigil, a silent vigil and protest march to the Capitol, to the Texas State Capitol. 
They did that with no permit. Mm -hmm. They did that with social media organizing, right? They did that in ways that I had not seen before where it was the issue at hand, right? So what, what's surprising to me is when you embrace your freedom, true freedom, and, and you stay focused on the matter at hand, which is justice, right? Which is real equality. If we're going to go for that with unapologetically, so much stuff can happen, amazing things can happen when you make space for that. They did this again, protest with police escort with no permit. Over 300 people marched to the Texas state capitol. I'm talking Ted Cruz land here. I'm talking <laughs> Abbott is governor, Jesus. It, it, and without incident, it was in silence. It was a beautiful, it was amazing. What they also did was they said, we're going to line up in a certain way to do this march. I said, huh, what? Now I was there, they asked me to come and share a poem. I'm like, I got you, I got the poems. But then watching, they were like, we're gonna, gonna line up black people first. I was like, you do that at a protest? We can tell people where to stand? It was we, all people protest? No, black people first, because they understood that we are the ones putting our lives on the line and you are not gonna marginalize us. You are not gonna put us to the side when we are out here demanding justice for our own lives. They had said black people first, then brown people next, then other next, then white people in the back of the march. And they, everybody followed. There was no incident. Mm -hmm. And everybody respected that, and everybody knew why, right? And then we marched all the way from East Austin across I-35, which is the main highway that cuts through Texas running from north to south. We marched over that down 6th Street, right through, I, I believe it was pre, yeah, almost, uh, no, it, there was some festival going on, but there's always a music festival in the live uh, music capital of the world. And we marched right down 6th Street, again, in silence, hundreds of people in that order, got to the steps of the Texas State Capitol. It was amazing. And then they said, we're not going to do any interviews with any major media outlets until every brown blogger, Twitter, social media journalist gets a comment first. I said, you can do that? And they said, yeah. So for me, that's been very surprising and, and warming and, and encouraging to see we don't have to follow the master's rules. Once you start saying that, once you start doing that, that's what you see now. That's what you see with the disruptions. That's what you see with the outcries. That's what you see with the organizing in new and brilliant ways is because they're changing the rules and we need to catch up. They, that's the future. All right. Um, thank you so much. Thank you um, for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> um, I would like to thank our panelists for their thoughtful commentary on the subject of blackness and social activism in America. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience for coming out this evening. Um, if you would like to be kept in the loop on future events through the African American Center here at the library, please be sure to leave your email address on the sign-in sheet on your way out. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.